Good evening, everyone. This is Anshul. Uh, okay, we are live now. All right, good. good evening, guys. Welcome to the talk. Uh, look into emulators by Kishore Karanish. Uh, this is Anshul Kharani. I'll be your host for the day. Uh, Kishore is a fourth year student who has uh, created two emulators by himself and has dabbled in several other domains, including this one. Uh, so, delaying this no further, I would like to invite Kishore Ganesh to start with this talk. Okay, just a sound check. Uh, we can all hear, right? Okay. So, so let's get started. Uh, okay. So today's session is going to be about emulators. So first, again, as Anshul said, I've created two emulators. And uh, so basically, this is my first talk. So just forgive me if uh, it's it's a bit uh, unorganized, right? So that's a, that's a disclaimer early on, right? So let's first discuss what are emulators, right? So uh, an emulator is basically a software that's uh, intended to recreate the uh, environment of the original software so for example you would have software that is designed to maybe run on windows or on, on a, or on linux or maybe it may be designed to run on x86 architecture or some other hardware architecture right and so what you want to do is to fool the software into thinking that it is running it in its original environment and so for that you create this sort of abstraction layer which we call as an emulator so that's basically what an emulator is right so there are two different poles when it comes to emulators. There is the low level emulation and then there's the high level emulation. So the primary difference between them is the level of abstraction. So in low level emulation, what actually um, happens is that uh, we, inst uh, instead of having these uh, high level function calls, what we actually have is that uh, we are actually recreating the entire hardware of the original system from scratch inside the software. So the, uh, all, everything about the original software, whatever CPU it has, whatever cache it has, whatever registers it has, whatever sort of hardware aspects are required for its functioning, those are being captured by our low-level emulation code, right? And so uh, in low-level emulation, actually, we are processing instructions that are uh, machine code instructions, the assembly level instructions. Since And this was the approach chosen for older consoles since they did not uh, have these high level languages to be written coded, right? And high level emulation, what you actually do is uh, you you don't operate at the level of uh, singular instructions and you operate at a much broader level. You have these uh, much bigger uh, function calls such as say the draw API call or maybe some other API call, right? And so uh, what you're basically doing is you're not actually simulating the hardware step by step and instead you're just fulfilling the contract that is required by that particular API call, right? So now, uh, now, uh, that, that's the difference. Like, for example, the draw API call itself in a high level emulation, uh, you'll just be uh, taking the draw level API call and then you'll be re implementing it on your own platform. In low level emulation, uh, there is no such thing as a, a high level draw call. There will be multiple, uh, like 30 to 40 instructions that you have to simulate in order to draw a single pixel on the screen. Now, the difference between these two approaches is that uh, in low level uh, emulation, what actually occurs is that uh, uh, since you have to uh, uh, reverse engineer the original hardware, how it actually functions and capture all that in code, there is a little bit of uh, upfront work involved, but the actual scope of the code is uh, much smaller than high level emulation because what a CPU does is very simple things. It may, be, um, it may move data from here to there, it may change the data. And so uh, the, the instructions themselves, each instruction themselves is very simple. In high level emulation, since we are actually implementing on a higher level, uh, just imagine the size of the Windows API, how big the API is. So that's why uh, it takes uh, uh, a lot of time to get stuff uh, uh, working on high level emulation, right? So in high level emulation, so uh, I'll just be getting into the further benefits in just a second. But first, let's look at a lower level degree of emulation, which is transistor level, of, uh, transistor level emulation. So in the previous slide, what I talked about was uh, that we are going to be simulating the CPU, the resistors, and all that. And then we'll actually be uh, writing, encoding whatever the original hardware is supposed to do in code. Now, transistor level emulation is a step below that. So in this, what actually happens, so you're not even simulating the CPU, you're not even simulating either the hardware. What you're actually doing is you're just simulating the physics of a single transistor, a single transistor. 
and you know that uh, if uh, voltage is applied to some points in the transistor then you know that the output is uh, out of the transistor is going to change in some way right so now uh, in transistor level emulation what you actually do is you take the original cpu you uh, you then uh, remove the protective covering using maybe sulfuric acid you you use a high you use a microscope to get the picture of the actual cpu and then what you do is uh, you try uh, you digitize this whole diagram and then you send it into the uh, and then you simulate each element of this digitized diagram so again you're just simulating the physics of the transistor you just have to write 200 to 300 lines of code for a single transistor and since this whole uh, schematic diagram consists of just transistor and nodes and the uh, and since you are emulating them you would be able to actually capture the behavior of the original system. So the difference between this and low level emulation is that in low level emulation, you actually have to figure out what the hardware is doing and what sort of uh, uh, quirks it has. And in transistor level emulation, since you are literally simulating the original circuit diagram step by step, uh, uh, all those, uh, you, you've not actually, uh, every, all of these details are being implicitly captured. Right? So now, why would we not go for such an accurate level of emulation? So now here comes the difference between lower levels of emulation and higher uh, degrees of emulation, which is the amount of accuracy uh, you get versus the uh, time it takes to actually uh, run this stuff. So let's look at the transistor level emulation. What is actually happening? So some sort of voltage lines are being active across a transistor and uh, its output changes maybe other uh, transistors, right? So there may be thousands of transistors and you'll be simulating each uh, transistor's operation. And so what will happen is uh, each transistor will affect the other transistors and this, these changes will continue propagating till the whole system reaches equilibrium. So all of this, uh, see the, the center processing unit and the memory uh, memory unit and all of the stuff that are parallel in the original this, and that all of these operations that take one clock cycle on the original hardware, what is actually happening now is that you uh, have multiple higher level uh, instructions for a single uh, clock cycle. So this particular transistor level emulator, uh, which uh, which is written in JavaScript, it is actually a million times slower than the original system. And the same uh, transistor level emulator, which is, uh, and again, this transistor level emulator is not created by me, it's created by someone else. I'm just le uh, letting you know about a particular uh, type of emulation. So basically, and uh, the same software written in C, it is just it is thousands of times slower. And you can understand that, right? Because uh, for each, uh, CPU clock cycle, you have tens or fifteens of high level instructions on your system that is running in addition to the obvious overhead of the operating system and all that. So that's why transistor level emulation is much slower, right? So now let's, uh, let's look at what it takes to actually run an accurate emulator on a modern computer, right? So the SNES, for those who don't know, it is a super Nintendo entertainment system. It, re uh, it released in around uh, 1987, right? And so around 30 years before. So obviously you would expect that uh, for simulating it accurately, it will be an easy task for today's CPUs. And actually you'd be wrong because even though the emulators started coming out in the early 90s, the most accurate SNES emulator that actually uh, simulates each one of its original intricacies, it actually takes a three gigahertz processor, uh, uh, three gigahertz modern processor to actually run. Right, because it is actually for uh, for each of its clock cycles. Again, it's taking hundreds of clock cycles on our machine in order to simulate the original hardware. Right, so, and this uh, uh, this article I'll uh, I'll share the link after the talk. That uh, this link. So basically, you can look at the challenges uh, that go into making an accurate low level emulator. And again, this is a for a console that released 30 years ago. And this is where we get the advantage of high level emulation in which since we are just, what we are doing is we are translating these high level function calls to high level function calls on our machine. So obviously we are going to be having multiple high level function calls, but, and it is obviously going to be slower, but the slowness is going to be much uh, of a much smaller, uh, smaller scope than it is in low level emulation. So just for a comparison, we have the Nintendo entertainment system which released in 1985, right? And we have the first NES emulator that released in 1997. Now this was the first low level emulator, the first emulator in fact for the NES. And uh, it itself was uh, uh, filled with hacks, it was not very accurate and uh, it, it could not really render at an acceptable frame rate in 1997, right? And there is another console 
called the Nintendo 64, which released in 1996. And below you can see its graphics. The first, on the top, you can see the NES graphics. And on the bottom, you can see uh, the N64's graphics, right? And the N64 emulator released just three years after the original system. Right? And uh, yeah, uh, and just remember, last slide I said that even after 20 years, we need a powerful CPU to simulate a fairly old system. So how was this uh, this system was able uh, to simulate a 3D console that was released just three years before on a 350 megahertz processor? And that is where high-level emulation actually uh, exerts its advantage because in high-level emulation, uh, it just simulates the high-level C function calls and converts them to the uh, Windows API calls. And so it is able to run at a fairly fast frame rate, with the disadvantage being that since uh, the API uh, surface is so large, it takes, uh, it. Uh, uh, for each game, you need to figure out what sort of function calls it makes, and then you need to translate that, right? So now let's look at how does a CPU work, right? So whenever a CPU starts, whenever you start the machine, it goes to a particular uh, set address called the reset vector. And from there, it starts executing instructions one by one, right? That's the basic idea of a CPU, uh, fetch, decode, and execute. So a CPU does mainly three things. It may have a lot of instructions, but all of them boil down to these three points. It may move data from one place to the other. It may change the data. It may it may add, it may subtract, it may do XOR or anything else, right? And the third one is that it may change the next instruction. For example, we have the uh, go-to instruction, the loop instruction. The CPU may change from where it is executing instructions from. So, so one of the... Uh, confusions, one of the things that you may have is uh, how does the CPU actually um, no, differentiate between all of these bytes? Because we have the instruction, we have what uh, what sort of data it takes. So how does the CPU actually differentiate? Because for it, it uh, all these are just numbers, right? And the answer to that is context. So the basic idea is that the CPU will be uh, pre-programmed in such a way that it will take the first byte and assume it as the instruction code and say it may take the next two bytes and assume them as the address. That is a very sort of simple uh, scheme. And the other scheme is that, say, for some sort of instruction, say, such as a move into accumulator, we already know that the destination is the accumulator, so we don't need any uh, particular memory address. So uh, it may be that for certain instructions, they may be just one byte, and for some other instructions, it may be three bytes. So uh, the CPU uh, is programmed in such a way to take this context into consideration. It will take the first uh, instruction as the first byte as the instruction code and the next two as the address. Right? That's uh, one sort of example. So the reason why this uh, sort of uh, the ability of the CPU to move data from one place to another is so powerful is because uh, the uh, the CPU's memory is not limited just to the RAM. Right? It also has all of the other devices, like say the controller, the display unit, the other units, they are all assigned certain addresses into the memory. So whenever the CPU says that I want to put data into this address, then the memory management unit actually may send this data to a particular device based on the address. So on the right here, you would see that this is the uh, memory layout or memory map of a Nintendo Entertainment System. So if you put a data in 4020, it may go into the input output registers. And if you put data from 2000 onwards, it would go into the RAM. Right? And so the CPU, what it's actually able to do is it is sort of able to make a hardware function call. Like for example, we, we may have the display card, which may take the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and say three bytes, which is RGB, so 24 bits for the pixel value, and there may be an active value. And each one of these parts may be assigned an address. This is just very hypothetical, right? This is very abstract. So uh, if the CPU puts uh, into address one, it will go into the X coordinate, two Y coordinate, and uh, four to seven, it will go into the value. So as soon as the CPU puts one into the active bit, the display card will take this information and then render uh, the value of the X and Y coordinate on the screen. This is a possible way how the CPU can actually affect something outside its scope, how the CPU is actually able to display something on screen, right? So now, all this time, we have been talking about emulators in a very, very uh, abstract manner. So let's try to become a little bit more concrete, right? So what an emulator is, is it's basically this large, very large state machine, right? So each part of the emulator, like say the central processing unit, the picture processing unit, each may have some data, 
right? It may have the registers, the flags, whether the CPU has an interrupt or not, or, uh, what data is there in the memory, what, uh, what pixels are currently being displayed on the screen. So these are some examples of the state that the emulator needs to keep track of, right? So um, uh, what the basic idea is, if you have ever programmed a video game, then you would know the idea of a core game loop. So the idea behind a core game loop is that uh, each iteration, uh, it may move each uh, each player on the screen one unit forward. It may move the enemies one unit forward. It may check for collisions. It may increase the scores, etc. So in the score game loop, what it basically doing is it is moving the entire world one time step forward. So if the players are coordinate x, then uh, in the next iteration they may move to x plus one, right? And uh, that's what is basically happening in a video game. And the same concept actually carries over to emulators in that what you're actually doing is that in each iteration, each iteration, you're moving the CPU, the PPU, and everything else, one unit forward, looking at what changes are there. Like for example, the CPU may execute the next instruction, right? And it may, uh, it may change the flags, it may, uh, depending on the instruction, it may change uh, move data from here to there. And the other unit, like for example, the picture processing unit, it may render one more line of pixels onto the screen. So everything is about this core game loop, right? Core loop. So now let's, uh, in which what we are basically doing is we are driving each one of these components one cycle forward, right? And and so I'll just get into this in a second, right? So one one of the key ideas that we um, take from video games is that is that uh, the idea of uh, uh, the every all the movements being independent of the frame rate. So the idea is that say say you have a video game, right? And so uh, you're moving the character, the player character, say one unit forward, right? So that's what you're basically doing. You're moving the uh, character one unit forward. So if uh, if you're moving this one unit per frame. Then if one frame takes 10 milliseconds, then in one second you cover 100 units. And if it takes more time, then in one second you're covering 50 units. So on different computers, you would have different frame rates. So of course, this is not ideal, right? In the same amount of time, we are moving uh, different number of units. Uh, and uh, so uh, what you actually want to do is instead of making this uh, one unit per frame, you would uh, want to make it proportional to the time. Right. So instead, what you do is uh, you have some sort of mechanism in which you make all the movements proportional to the time. So uh, irrespective of how much time each frame takes, irrespective of how many frames are being moved, you actually have constant movement per time step. Right. And in the emulator, uh, this same thing is happening. Right. So what you do is whatever the CPU does, you break it, break down that operation into uh, cycles. So, for example, the CPU may fetch the next instruction from memory, may decode this instruction, and uh, what it will do is it will run this instruction. That's one sort of uh, idea behind an emulator cycle, right? And so, uh, 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 what you do is that each component uh, operation is broken down into cycles, and it is given a certain number of cycles, and the component runs for that many number of cycles, right? And uh, uh, and uh, it is in the granularity of the cycle counting, which is where the slowness of the emulator comes in. It depends on what you take as a cycle. You can actually put cycles every line of the code that this is taking one cycle, this is taking one cycle, but that will become a little bit too slow, right? So you want to strike a balance between accuracy and uh, running the code. So one of the key ideas, one of the key challenges behind why and uh, making an emulator is difficult is that you need to keep all of these uh, components in sync. Right, because each one of these components, it was not designed by the emulator designers to be. Uh, by, it was not designed by the hardware designers to actually be emulated. Right, you have uh, each uh, you uh, all of these uh, components were designed to be run in parallel, whether it be the center processing unit or the picture processing unit or the audio processing unit. So that's why. Uh, uh, I'm making an emulator slightly challenging in that uh, you need to have all of these three components running in sync, right? So now let's actually look at, uh, I'll just get into how this emulator cycle uh, is implemented in code in a bit. Uh, but let's actually look at an even more concrete example of an actual uh, system, 
right? So the Nintendo Entertainment System, you all, didn't, all you need to know about this is that it was, uh, it is a console from the 80s and it brought us this, uh, all of these uh, uh, great titles such as Mario, Donkey Kong, Mega Man, and many other games that we cherish now, right? So the Nintendo Picture Processing Unit, what it does is it actually uh, follows the same procedure. It has a particular procedure for rendering stuff on the screen. And what it does is it keeps reading from some set memory locations. And uh, what it does is it uh, follows the same procedure and renders stuff for the screen. So the CPU, the only way it can change anything on the screen is by changing uh, the memory uh, locations that the PPU is reading from, right? The PPU is always going to be doing the same thing. It is the responsibility of the CPU to change the data that the PPU is reading, right? That's how these two components are running in sync. So let's look at some calculations about why the Nintendo Entertainment System actually does things the way it does. So the NES has this resolution of 256 by 240 pixels. So let's assume that we take uh, an RGB uh, array for uh, th this pixel grid. So each time maybe the picture processing unit wants to output a frame, we'll output three bytes per pixel, which is around uh, 180 kilobytes. So for the, doing it the normal RGB way, we need 180 kilobytes. But how much does the Nintendo Entertainment System actually have? It has just two kilobytes of memory. So understandably, the Nintendo designers had to do clever stuff into how the picture processing unit actually renders stuff on the screen, right? So uh, the, one of the key, the, one of the first key ideas behind the NES rendering thing, and all of this stuff I think is going to make a, uh, a little bit more concrete how rendering happens on a low level emulation system, right? So these are all the steps that are followed in one particular hardware, right? So one of the first ideas is that you partition the whole screen into eight by eight tiles, right? And for each tile you store, uh, so each tile for uh, each pixel, you store only two bits, right? And these are stored in this manner. You have eight, uh, eight numbers of one byte. And again, eight numbers of one byte. So these are two rows of uh, uh, to total of 16 bytes. So each row is a byte, so it has eight bits, eight by eight, which is 64. And uh, the corresponding pixel, like for example, uh, here, uh, this is the last pixel of the first row and uh, zero and zero. And so the corresponding uh, uh, bits for each pixel are actually the pattern table number. So now, because we have uh, these uh, tiles being stored, right, uh, eight by eight tiles, so what we can do is we don't, uh, we can actually actually refer to these uh, tiles by the number. So uh, we know that uh, the 24 tile means that uh, it, it refers to a particular pattern table type, right? And so well, as you can see here on the screen, there's a lot of 24 tiles being used. But 24 is just a number, it's just one byte, right? And by using, uh, and it is, uh, the NES, what it does, it looks at this 24, it knows that it has to run the pattern number 24, it goes to pattern number 24 and looks at what eight by eight pattern it has and then renders that on the screen. So by using this uh, sort of method, it is actually able to save a lot of memory since now uh, for each 24, you take only one byte instead of you actually taking 16 bytes, right? So that's one of the key ideas. And again, you can see here, this is a 62 pattern tile number. So it's a different pattern tile number. And this uh, image actually illustrates how the name table uh, actually operates. So the name table is a data structure that actually tells the NES that for this section of the screen, use this tile number, right? That's what the name table tells. Now, the, now there is also something called the attribute table, which uh, for the pattern table, we partition into eight by eight sections of the screen. For the attribute table, we actually partition the whole screen into 32 by 32 sections. And for each section, we again store two bits. Now, uh, I'll just get into why we actually need an attribute table, right? So this is where uh, all of this information actually comes together, right? So the NES has a total of uh, 64 colors, right? It has a total of 64 colors. And at a time, uh, only 32 colors can be used. At the time, only 32 colors can be used to display something on the screen. And the programmer actually chooses uh, this, these 32 colors and puts them in some sort of uh, table, right? It's called a palette table. And for uh, referring to each one of these 32 colors, you need 32 addresses, which means you need five bits. And this is where uh, everything comes together. So these five bits are composed like this. You have two, uh, two bits from the uh, pattern table pixel, 
and then two bits from the attribute, right? And then you have one bit telling us whether it is a foreground or the background. Uh, each has 16 bytes available, right? So because of this attribute, because of this attribute, uh, what happens uh, if you remove, if you uh, look at what is there after the attribute, you have two bits. So you have four colors available. So the restriction that the Nintendo imposes is that uh, within each 32 by 32 part of the screen, you can have a maximum of just four colors. And even with that, these people have been able to realize some really impressive artwork, right? And so as you can see here, we have, uh, we have for the same screen, we're partitioning into 32 by 32 sections. And uh, the, for each 32 by 32 section can have a maximum variety of four colors. And within that, we have eight by eight tiles for which we store two bits, right? And these two bits. And again, these act as addresses into the palette table, the entries of which the programmer fills out. So that the programmer can say, say that the full, uh, if it is 0, 0, 0, 0, then the color is red, right? And so you don't need to store the RGB pairs again and again. You just need to refer to the color by a certain number. And the NES internally translates it to uh, a number. It's sort of like pointers, right? You don't need to store the whole array. You just need to store the pointer to an array wherever you uh, you are referring to it, right? Now, this is another example of redundancy, which I particularly like. So basically, in, in, in Super Mario, the clouds are actually the same pattern tiles as the ones used for the bushes. And you can see that this is the bottom part is actually being masked away by this. And you can see that the these uh, the ground tiles are actually being repeated. So again, this is saving a lot of memory. You are you are actually reusing the same assets across your uh, game. And you, uh, you, since you have the attribute, you, this has a different attribute to this attribute. So the the whatever index it refers to here it means white here it means green right so again you can see you can sort of visualize that the whole screen is being divided into eight by eight sections now one of the other interesting things about the picture processing unit uh, or the nintendo uh, is how it actually implements scrolling so the nintendo entertainment system actually takes a little bit of a luxury here it has not one but two name tables. So at a time, it actually can have, instead of storing a 256 by 240 pixels of the screen, it, it can have something that represents 512 by 240 pixels of the screen or 256 by 480 pixels of the screen. So by doing this, in, uh, since, since the NES CPU is not fast enough to uh, update this whole name table every frame, instead what you do is you have this whole uh, 512 by 240 region and you Grow, use, uh, the, uh, you have some register that tells the NES that uh, you need to start rendering from this point, right? And so uh, 256 by 240 window sort of moves through the screen, making scrolling very uh, simple and fast, right? So by, by using two name tables, it is actually able to use a small window into the screen, right? So that's how scrolling is actually being implemented. Now let's also look at audio processing, how the Nintendo, uh, let's actually not look at the particular details of audio. Let's look at just sound programming in general, right? So let's look at sound programming in general. So the idea is that uh, you have the sound wave, right? You have the sound wave. And what you do is you sample the sound wave at particular points, right? And you sample the sound wave at particular points. And so these become numbers. These may be 16-bit numbers. These may be 32-bit numbers. These may be floating point numbers. Irrespective of that, if you send these numbers into the audio card, what it does is it actually uh, it actually uh, is able to play audio, right? And uh, one of the core theories is that uh, you need to be sampling at twice the frequency of this uh, signal in order, in a, and then you'll have no loss whatsoever. That's the basic idea. I think it's called the Nyquist frequency or something, right? But anyways, one of the challenges that you will face when making an emulator is that the, the NES, it outputs at 800,000 samples per second. But our PC order card, it's supposed to only 41,100 samples per second. And it may be, uh, it may take 48,000 samples, it may take 80,000 samples, but 800,000 samples is just too high. It's not able to support that. So what you do is you actually take every 20th sample. So by that you reduce the number of samples from 800,000 to 40,000 samples, right? And so if you have 40,000 uh, samples, uh, it will play the audio just fine. It will be recognizable. But the problem with that is still is that 
uh, you can consider the number of samples to be some sort of precision. So the data that was encoded in 800,000 samples, now we're encoding it at 44,100 samples. So obviously there's obviously going to be uh, some sort of data that the 44,100 samples cannot represent. And it is precisely the frequencies about 22 kilohertz, 22 kilohertz. So whatever these high frequencies are, when they are down sampled, what happens is that they leave a lot of these artifacts in the audio wave. So this thing that I've not done yet, is that you actually need to implement some sort of filter that removes these high frequencies before downsampling. That's something you need to do, right? So in order to prevent uh, the audio from sounding very rough. Now, one of the interesting things about the NES is that it has uh, the cartridges themselves are circuits in their own right. And I told you about uh, the previous slide that we have certain limitations in sort of uh, memory. So later on, uh, although the, all the initial, say, for three, four years, all the games complied with these limitations, but later the developers figured out that you can actually have these circuits on the chip. And the NES, for the NES, uh, it's just, uh, nothing is changing. Uh, the NES is seeing the same thing. And say the NES is uh, able to access eight kilobytes of uh, ROM. Right. So what the mapper does is at just the right time, it has actually 32 kilobytes of uh, read-only memory, and it uh, it makes the NES view a certain 8 kilobyte section of the memory. So as far as the NES is concerned, it is viewing just 8 kilobytes of memory, but because of the mapper, it is able to uh, actually access 32 kilobytes of memory. Right. So this is one of the interesting things that I found about NES cartridges. And later on, the cartridges became much more advanced. Like uh, some of them actually added uh, this uh, facility of uh, uh, the storing stuff. In the uh, the NES does not have any sort of SD card facility, so some cartridges actually included this sort of facility on the cartridge itself. And some other cartridges they actually added another audio audio circuit. So just imagine how cool is that? It's just like modern PCIe expansion cards. You put the card in, you suddenly have better audio. Right. So that's one of the so now, now this these are some challenges that emulators uh, or developers also face in that they have to uh, they have to actually simulate the working of each one of these special bridges. So that's also where some difficulty arises. So now let's actually look into some of the code. We are not going to be looking at a very low level uh, code. So let's actually look at some very high level code. Right. So um, the this. This is the basic idea. You don't need to understand this line. I'll just I'll just walk you through a little bit. So there is an infinite loop going on, right? It's the core game loop. This is the core game loop of the emulator, right? And so what's happening is as long as the NES has CPU cycles, it is going to keep cycling. And as long as it is, has the audio processing unit cycle, it's going to keep cycling. And it also, as long as it has picture processing unit cycle, it's going to keep cycling. But uh, uh, and these, uh, this sort of uh, stuff is being replenished by the NES uh, set time function. So what happens is that after each cycle, it calculates how much time occurred between this uh, cycle's beginning and previous cycle's ending, and then it sets that time into the NES. So the NES, uh, we know that the CPU runs at 1.79 megahertz, right? So of, uh, it's 1.79 million, I guess, 1.79 million. Uh, 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 per second and we have the delta which is given to us in milliseconds so we know that it needs to run uh, these many cycles uh, in the time given so we are making the cycles proportional to the time you don't need to understand the exact formula but basically we are making the cycles proportional so that's one thing i wanted to show you is how we are actually doing the whole cycles thing now the second thing i want to show you is basically how we are actually representing a lot of the stuff in the code so uh, if you see here, we have this class called CPU, and we have these registers. Each register is just one byte long, so that's why it is called A, X, Y, P, whatever, whatever you can name it. It's, it's one byte long, that's why it's a cat. Right? And similarly, you have this uh, I of memory. So you might wonder how memory is actually being implemented, and memory is just an array. Uh, right. So if you have two kilobytes of RAM, you allocate two into one zero two four bytes, and that array of care, which again is one byte, means that you have one zero two four bytes of RAM. Right. And so this is sort of uh, a way how you can actually uh, you're figuring out uh, you're actually implementing some of the hardware characteristics of the uh, original system. Right. And uh, one thing I would like to um, show you is about the mapper. So I did tell you that. Uh, uh, so uh, I did tell you that the 
uh, the NES, it actually has these uh, mappers on the cartridge, right? So what it has, as you can see here, we have eight banks of 16 kilobytes each, right? And depending on the current state of the NES, we may switch between each of these banks. And so the NES may think it is a, it still has 16 kilobytes of memory, but it is actually accessing a much larger portion of memory, right? Okay, so that's uh, that's a little bit about the NES. And again, all of these stuff like the cartridge, and uh, all that stuff that will be represented in a similar manner. Again, the cartridge has uh, CHR ROM 8192 bytes. You don't need to understand the exact stuff, but uh, basically this is how some parts of the hardware are captured, right? And let's come to the CPU actually. And so what we have here is, uh, yeah. So. Uh, every cycle, what the CPU does, it checks for interrupts, whether any interrupts are active, and depending on that, it starts some procedure. And if there are no interrupts, then it processes the next instruction, which is one big switch case. And uh, in each instruction itself is very uh, simple. Like for example, we go to the AND, it is just uh, each instruction itself is very simple, right? And it just ends the data, right? And so you'd find that uh, I have uh, written a lot of these logs across the code, like this practically logging everywhere. And this is where I, I share some of the lessons I learned. So the first lesson is that an emulator is going to be an abstract system. It is going to be difficult to debug because uh, you can stop it at any one point in the debugger. But since, and uh, for a low level emulator, it takes 40 to 50 instructions to get something uh, substantial uh, running. Uh, you, what you're looking at is a very small part of the overall space. So what you want to do whenever you're debugging such a system is you need to add logs everywhere. Everywhere in the code, you need to add logging so that you can actually uh, get a look into what is actually happening after the run. And when an error occurs, you can actually look at the logs and see what is happening. Now, the second thing is that uh, it, it's a follow up to the previous point. Now, since I had added logging everywhere, since I had added logging everywhere, it naturally became very slow. But at that point of time, I did not know why it was slow, right? So uh, whenever I have this large project and it turns out to be slow and I don't know where, where to start uh, fixing the performance, I just use a performance profiler. Actually, this was a, a project where I first used a performance profiler. And the performance profiler actually told me that 40% of the time was being wasted in print statements. And that is natural, right? Because if I'm executing a print statement thousands of times per second, then it obviously is going to become slow. So as soon as I commented that out and fixed a few more bugs, it actually became a decent performance, right? Now that's the first thing. The second thing is always uh, write a lot of unit tests, right? Because again, uh, each one of these units depends on each other. And there are a lot of these little quirks. I had this one bug where because I had missed uh, by a plus one, nothing was displaying on the screen. So 99% of the time, you won't be seeing anything on the screen because of all of these little bugs, which uh, all of these little details, which you have not captured, right? So what you want to do, which I did not do initially and I suffered later, so what you want to do is once you say write the central processing unit, you want to write unit tests for it and then start with the picture processing unit. Uh, my problem was that I started with the picture processing unit. I did not know whether the bug was in the picture processing unit or in the central processing unit. So the, a lot of time was wasted initially in debugging. So once I added all of these tests, I was able to figure out a lot of these small bugs, right? Now the second thing, is that once your emulator is about 50 to 60 percent complete, once you have a, the basic uh, framework of an emulator functioning, you should use a test ROM. Like for these consoles, like say the NES or the SNES, a lot of people have written emulators for it before, right? It's nothing new. So a lot of people have actually invested time in creating a lot of these unit tests. And so what you should do is uh, you should be using these test ROMs in order to further figure out what other bugs you have. And again, you just just be very careful with signed and signed integers, signed bit extension, etc., because they're going to be causing a lot of small bugs, right? And uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. Now let's look at some of the progress uh, pictures of the actual emulation. So initially, of course, the screen was blank. Nothing was displaying. So of course, we go through it. We have some weird pattern tiles appearing. We had some other stuff appearing. Nothing is actually resembling. And this is where we actually seem to get a little bit of text. And again, patterns, patterns, patterns. This is what you're going to be seeing most of the time of your emulator development, right? And if you can uh, see the 
and we just keep seeing now we have the first semblance of an actual game right we have the score being displayed here if you see here right and then uh, finally again we have patterns you often have regressions in emulator development and so all of these weird pattern tiles weird stuff happening and again we have another level of the game right we have finally some sort of text being displayed right and then uh, we keep going we have the whole level displaying finally, but none of the characters, right? And actually, if you will see here, is that uh, this, um, again, you have uh, other uh, patterns, but uh, here, finally, you have some of the title text displaying OK in a fine manner, although the colors are messed up. And now, as you will see here, is that you see these two uh, white dots. These are actually the eyes of the character because I messed up some of the color rendering. And we finally have sprites starting, although they did not look like anything. And again, we keep going, keep going. And if you see here, uh, you have you see this smile, right? And this same smile is that of this uh, ape. This is how. Uh, this is not my emulator. This is someone else's emulator. And this is how it's actually supposed to look like, right? And so. Uh, we keep going. We have the text looking fine now. We keep going. Now we have the princess uh, looking OK. She looks like a, a some sort of character. Mario also looks OK, a little bit weird. OK, we continue. We keep going. And the princess looking fine now. Mario is looking fine now. And uh, we have the apes uh, details finally coming up. And so these are all results of fixing the bugs. I'm running the same software, but still there are lots of bugs here. And so uh, as soon now, finally, the apes colors are fixed. We have these sprites appearing. Mario also looks fine. And finally, we have the uh, emulator, right? And we have this here, emulator. We have Mario here, right? So and that's how the emulators progress uh, look like. So I'll just show you uh, the emulator in its current stage uh, running a lot of the games. So we have this GIF of uh, one game. We have another game. And so, as you can see, the NES displays a fairly wide variety of uh, graphics, right? And this, I think, is one of the most beautiful NES games. Uh, again, we have Super Mario Bros., the original. And all of these are running on the uh, out uh, about uh, yep, uh, halfway complete emulator. And not, not halfway, about 70% complete emulator. So overall outlook, uh, since this is a this is a project that consumes external data, it consumes external ROM files. Once I have the, since now I have the emulator up and running, I can play at least uh, 100 games on the same emulator. I just put a different ROM file, and since the instructions are all in the ROM file about what to do, and my emulator just follows those instructions, it is actually able to run 100 games, right? And for the future, of course, we need order resampling, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, since we have made the base, we can now experiment. And this is where I want to get into in the uh, end, in which one guy, this is uh, what he had done. Basically, what he had done is he, instead of making an emulator, what he had done is he had taken the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System hardware and it uh, modified one of the cartridges in such a way that uh, the cartridge contents are replaced by an RPI. And it's not the case that uh, he's replaced the NES hardware in the internals by the RPI, just replace the cartridge. And it actually tricks the NES into displaying his, the RPI's output onto the screen. So this is what I liked a lot, which is the, uh, I think it was called uh, uh, reverse, reverse emulator. Yep. So this is just some uh, mess stuff that I want to talk about. So, so he actually is able to modify the uh, hardware and this whole whole thing is actually being displayed on the on the screen right so he's actually able to run the software of a console that came 10 years later on the nes because he modified the cartridge in such a way that the nes displays whatever he wants right so you should check out this video i'll be linking it now the last thing i want to talk about is although for me emulation was a challenging project uh, since it was my you know, only my second emulator, emulation is actually nothing. Uh, it's, it's it's a small part of the larger scope of things. Like the reason I was able to create an emulator was because I had all of these resources available online. I had the uh, website called uh, NES Dev, in which all the hardware details of the original NES were listed out in a lot of detail. So. To get these hardware details, whenever you're starting with a new platform, which I've not learned yet, 
what you should do uh, whenever you're starting with a new platform, 90% of the time is going to be spent figuring out exactly what, what each hardware component does. Right? And so it's going to be taking a lo uh, lot of time uh, figuring out what are the various quirks, what sort of hardware it has. And so a guy named Bayou, which I talked about uh, earlier, who was building one of the most accurate emulators, he had to spend over 10 years in actually reverse engineering the Super Nintendo 88 system. He had spent around thirty to $40,000 in actually uh, getting these uh, various old systems in order so that he could analyze it. And even then, he was helped by a, um, by a charitable personality who had these million dollar microscopes who was willing to use these for this course. So of course, reverse engineering is where the real meat of the process is. And that's where I want to leave you. Um, that's all uh, for now. And so in the end, uh, you can follow me on uh, GitHub, uh, Telegram, and LinkedIn. You can take a screenshot if you want uh, to. Yep. So now let's uh, move on to the questions. All right, guys. Uh, Kishore, that was an amazing talk, bro. Um, now, moving on to the questions, I have one question here. Uh, the questionnaire is asking: Can overclocking be somehow done without messing up the audio, like uh, as in not preventing the speed up of audio, but not answering the audio quality that frequently? You know. Okay. Overclocking in which sense? I'm not uh, able to grasp uh, overclocking in which sense it's being talked about. I mean, they're saying as in not preventing the speed up of audio, but not worsening the audio quality either. That's uh, what I'm not talking. sure about that. I... Okay. So moving on to the next question. Question uh, two is that which was the first emulator that you programmed? Which, okay, so my first emulator was actually of the chip 8 system. So I recommend that everyone should start with the chip 8. I think the whole uh, emulator, it was only 700 lines of code. And the chip 8 itself has a very basic uh, uh, instruction set. So by building the chip 8, you can actually get an insight into how emulators work. And then you can use those insights whenever you're building a, some sort of more complex system like the NES or maybe the SNES. Okay, nice. Thank you for the insight. Um, I am not seeing any more questions coming up from the chat right now. So I guess that would be it. And uh, thank you so much for the efforts, Kishore. Right. Uh, so that was it from our side today. Um, thank you all for coming in and joining and uh, watching this, uh, uh, you know, broadcast by a broadcast on this talk by Kishore. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you guys later. Good night. Thank you.